Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us via Zoom for this amazing webinar hosted by the Jewish Federation and Assembly Member Richard Bloom. I'm Rabbi Noah Farkas. I helped create Sivruta a couple of years ago because I believe very deeply in the process and the profit of getting involved in civic life. America is a unique nation. When Alexis de Tocqueville came and saw our country for the first time and saw how people with passions and civic associations got together to change their democracy, he was astonished as a Frenchman. He wrote a whole book about it and it actually helped spur the French Revolution. And that's because the founders of our country, the United States of America, as flawed as they were, understood that you can separate church and state, but you really can't separate faith and politics. What that means is that in order to have faith, you have to believe in something greater than yourself, that you're attached to a story that has a past, a present, and hopefully a better future. And the way that we get to that future is not just by servicing the outcomes of injustice, but trying to get to the root causes by changing civic policy, engaging in civic life. And that's why we created Sivruta. It's a combination of two words. The first one being civics, which is the process of the citizens and residents of a country engaging in community discourse to make that country better. And the other is chavruta, which is an ancient Jewish term for friendship. Not friendship just between two buddies watching a game on a Sunday or um, friends in terms of just trying to take advantage of each other, but public friendship, friendship involved in the larger story. The word chevruta comes from Torah study, that two people who aren't identical can get together, learn a Torah, learn the process and tradition of the past, and divine what God's will is for the future. It's that kind of friendship that lends itself to civics and why we blend the two words together to call it sivruta. And I'm very, very honored to be with you tonight as I've been with the Federation for several years, doing a number of projects, engaging in community engagement, and trying to lend a Jewish voice to the civic conversation. I myself am a commissioner. I serve on the Los Angeles Homelessness Services Authority as a commissioner, and I'm its former chair and current chair of the Finance Committee. And I have to say it's been a beautiful and wonderful part of my life to try to help the homeless not just by feeding them, which I do, and not just by teaching them and being with them and collecting goods for them, which I do, but trying to get to those root causes to handle what I think and what every Angelino believes is the number one quality of life issue facing LA County today. So without further ado, and without further uh, acknowledgements, I do wanna welcome Assembly Member Bloom to this room and to uh, welcome him to run our panel this evening. Assembly Member Bloom, it is so good to have you here as a, a leader in California, a leader of the Jewish community, and uh, thank you for moderating tonight. Thank you so much, Rabbi Farkas, and thank you for your inspiring remarks. And good evening to all of you who are attending tonight. The response to this webinar has been overwhelming. There are hundreds of you who are participating uh, in this seminar about how to get appointed to a state board or commission. My name is Richard Bloom and I represent Assembly District 50 on the west side of Los Angeles. It includes the communities of Agora Hills, Malibu, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, and West Hollywood, and a good deal of West Los Angeles. As you all know, this has been an unusual year, what with social distancing and how it forced us to learn new ways of communicating. While I'm excited, we are getting closer to reopening. Uh, in fact, uh, we passed a milestone today in uh, Los Angeles. I, I, you know, Getting closer to reopening means being able to see friends, families, neighbors. And my hope is that we in government continue to take advantage of technology like we are tonight to help people connect with each other and with their government. Well, there's nothing like attending a city council meeting to voice your support for a example, for example, an affordable housing project in your city. Uh, those who are working long hours and multiple jobs should still have the option 
to participate and have their voices of support heard as well. I want to thank the Jewish Federation of Greater LA for partnering with us on tonight's event. And of course, I want to thank the governor and the speaker's offices for being uh, here tonight to make presentations and answer your questions. Uh, we did a similar in-person event in 2017 in conjunction with the City of West Hollywood Women's Leadership Conference. And that event, like tonight's, was extremely successful. We received lots of positive complimentary feedback after the event. And trust me, we don't always receive that in, in government. So I'm glad that we're here again to be able to host this event tonight. I've also seen over the past four years, starting uh, really with the Women's March following uh, the uh, Trump inauguration in 2017 and continuing through the presidential elections and uh, continuing on with rallies and protests for social justice, we've seen a rising number of people who are becoming newly active and civically engaged. And it really is a wonderful thing to see. In this past president, presidential election, nearly two thirds of eligible voters cast a ballot for president. I thought it was an excellent time to help people find additional pathways to serve their communities and help realize the power they have to affect change in their communities and state. There's so much talent in our district and around the state of California and so many diverse backgrounds and lived experiences that can add to our public policy discussions. Many want to participate, but might not know how. And so here we are tonight, uh, learning how to become appointed, what the best pathway is, what the technicalities are for becoming appointed to a state border commission. Many years ago, uh, uh, back in the, uh, way back in the 2000s, I was appointed to the California Coastal Commission. So this is something I know about and that I experienced myself. I was an appointee then of Senate Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg, I found the process intimidating. I didn't understand it, uh, but ultimately I was successful, fortunately, in being appointed and learned so much from my experience in uh, uh, on, on uh, the uh, California State Coastal Commission. So I can recommend to you um, that the path you're on tonight, learning about this appointment process is important and hopefully will make it a little bit easier for you in your journey. Before I introduce our two special guests this evening, I want to thank the Jewish Federation Council of Greater LA's Sivruta program that you just heard about from Rabbi Farkas and invite my friend and chair of community engagement at the Jewish Federation, Cece Filer, to say a few words. Thank you so much to my dear friend, long-term friend, um, assembly member Richard Bloom and his team for putting this program together tonight. The Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles is proud to be a partner with our legislators tonight and throughout the year. I have the pleasure of currently chairing the Community Engagement Strategic Initiative at the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles and being a past chair of JPAP, the Jewish Public Affairs Committee of California. In both roles, the Federation advocates in Sacramento on issues of importance to the Jewish community. We identify the greatest challenges in our community and create opportunities to meet those challenges. And often we are creating those opportunities in partnerships with our elected officials. We also believe in the power of civic engagement. And today's program is the perfect to connect our stakeholders and those throughout California with important opportunities for involvement and impact, impact change. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Assemblyman um, Bloom and thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Cece. Tonight, we're going to learn how to get appointed to a state board or commission. We're fortunate to have two outstanding guests that serve as the top advisors to Governor Newsom and Speaker Anthony Rendon as they carry out their appointment authority. We have Juan Torres, Deputy Chief of Staff 
and uh, who oversees the appointment process for Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon. And we're also very fortunate to have with us Secretary Catherine Rivera Hernandez, who serves as the appointment secretary to Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you both for being here tonight. We're going to have each of these individuals talk about the appointment process for each of their offices, how to apply, who should apply, what are they or their bosses looking for in applicants and the like. We will listen to each of them and hear about the different appointment processes for the governor and the speaker. And if at any time during the program you have a question, please use the Q&A feature on your screen to type your questions. We are going to hear them speak and then immediately following, we've saved plenty of time for questions and I'll pose your questions to our guests. So let's start with Secretary Rivera Hernandez. She was appointed by Governor Newsom in June 2019 to serve as appointment secretary. Prior to her appointment, she served three administrations as a board member of the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, better known as the ALRB, beginning with her appointment by Governor Gray Davis in November 2002. Prior to joining the ALRB, she served as the Chief Deputy Cabinet Secretary for Governor Davis. And as Chief Deputy, she served as the governor's liaison to various state agencies, departments, and boards, including the Health and Human Services Agency, the Department of Corrections, uh, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, the Office of Emergency Services, and Department of Food and Agriculture. As a member of the cabinet office, she was responsible for overseeing the development and implementation of administration, policy, and legislative initiatives within the agencies. She received her bachelor's degree in business management from Arizona State University and obtained her law degree from Berkeley Law, Go Bears, where she was the co-editor-in-chief of the La Raza Law Journal. Secretary Rivera Hernandez, welcome, and thank you for being here. The Zoom is yours. Thank you so much, Assembly Member of Loom, um, as well as Rabbi Farkas and the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. You are correct, assembly member, that your district has a great degree of talent. We have appointed people to the film commission, to water boards, licensing boards, the regents. We, they are serving in our administration at different levels. So um, this is just very a very exciting opportunity for uh, our office to have. Um, I think there is a belief that the appointments process is an insider's game. Um, but with close to 4,000 appointments that the governor makes, and that includes over 300 board and commission slots, we wouldn't get very far if we relied on uh, just the insiders. So hopefully I can remove the mystery um, around the process and encourage others to consider putting their name in the hat. I'll start out by saying that um, I may have a fancy title, but it is not as glamorous as it sounds. With the numbers that we have, we are an employment agency. So we have to rely on our online application process. Um, that is found at the governor's website at gov.ca.gov and there is an appointments tab there. In addition to the application itself, you will find a list of board and commissions vacancies that it, we update monthly. You will also see a list of current opportunities for paid jobs within the administration where we might have trouble recruiting people for those positions. You will also see a list of deputies and their portfolios. I obviously do not do this alone. We have a group of 12 of us that work on the appointments process. And I decided to add that information to the website because I wanted people to be able to go directly to the source. If you know exactly what you're interested in, you can email the deputy, they will give you a call and you can actually have that, that, that discussion. Um, trying to make this process as transparent as possible um, and as easy as possible. Um, that being said, the application itself is fairly detailed. It does ask a lot of sensitive questions. Um, so people will often ask, what is the governor looking for in appointees? Um, and I repeat what he has said many times. He wants his administration to look like the population it serves. But when we talk about diversity, it's no longer just about gender or ethnicity. Um, it really is about um, diversity of experiences, uh, geography, your upbringing, essentially what has led you to want to serve. 
as Rabbi Farkas pointed out, it's about the larger story. So my advice to people is to share that story. Um, we know people have had many varied experiences. In fact, we're counting on that. Uh, people have often said to me, I did not put in my application. I, I thought I would not qualify for this reason or that reason. Um, and what I tell people is along with the successes, we expect for people to have had bumps in the road. And if you have a comeback story, I have never met a governor uh, more here for that. So I always tell people, just don't take yourself out of the game. Put your hat in the ring. Let's have those conversations. Um, that's what we're there for. Um, like I said, our main, our main goal is to figure out what in those experiences um, would fit within the administration um, and would make you an ideal candidate to serve. Um, so when we are reviewing applications, we don't pull every person that has applied for a certain spot. We are often looking at a puzzle, especially with boards and commissions. Usually people um, have, are rolling out of terms. So we were looking at, in this puzzle, what skill set has rolled off? What area was being represented? What is the gender makeup um, of the board? And we're trying to put together that puzzle. So we may pull you know, somebody from the Central Valley who also is a manager um, and maybe has one other trait that we might be, be looking for. Um, and those are the applications we pull. Um, the downside to that is, yeah, we do not essentially review every single person that applies. The upside is what often happens is that because we do it that way, we pull people who did not apply for the position that we may be looking for. Um, and we often cold call people to have those discussions and say, hey, would you consider this? We think you would be a good fit. Um, I often will call people and they'll say, I didn't pick up initially because I thought you were a telemarketer. And I said, oh, I absolutely am a telemarketer. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. Um, and it's okay to say no to. Uh, you know, I, I think people often feel like they don't wanna seem ungrateful. We are always trying to find the right fit. And if we pull your name again, we will call you back again and ask um, and see if that other opportunity is a better fit. Uh, we really are just trying to find the right match for both the applicant and the um, administration. Um, and so what the other thing I will say though, but if there is something that you know you are interested in, that is what you absolutely want to do, um, then I recommend Googling it. Every board and commission is different. Um, there really are not a lot of generalities about them. And if you Google it and you go to the board's website, you, there's a treasure trove of information. You can see what the board makeup is, how often they meet, where they meet. We all know where we're meeting now, um, but who knows what the future will hold, um, how long the meetings are, and really how complex the issues are. If you read the minutes, it is a great way to see, oh, this is something that I would really like to do. Um, the other thing a, a Google search will tell you is how controversial a certain board or commission might be. Um, and if it's a subject matter or the board itself. And if you don't want your name in the paper, it is surely a good way to see if that is a possibility. So once we settle and we pull out the applications, we make the phone calls, we narrow down to a group of appointees and it really does vary. Um, if we are looking for someone and we end up with 10 or 15 people who um, are, might be good fits, we will most likely have a discussion with all of them. Um, there have been boards and commissions that we have interviewed up to 30 people for. So it gives you ideas that not all of them are that competitive. Um, others, it may only be three people um, that end up being a good fit. But at that point, there is a series of interviews. Um, it usually occurs at a department level um, and then at an agency level. Um, and then with the governor's office, um, every single appointee is interviewed by a deputy in my office or myself and a policy or other deputy um, very often from the cabinet office. Uh, and then after those discussions, and the other thing I will say about the interview process is we're really not trying to weed people out. It really is just that second step uh, when we talked about this broader story. We're trying to get to know you better, um, also share more about what the opportunity um, is. Um, as opposed to you know, trying to uh, narrow it down, we really are trying to give as many options um, to the governor as possible. So once we do settle though on a recommendation, sometimes it may I may go in with one for a position. Um, sometimes I may go in with two or three um, and have that discussion with the governor. 
I go in with him um, every week. Uh, I usually take in um, between 30 and 50, sometimes more appointees. So that gives you an idea of the pace that we are talking about. We are constantly at all times um, moving large numbers of people through this process. Um, at that point, he decides on um, his appointee. And I will also share that in those discussions, there's not a discussion about a resume per se, where they went to school. He assumes we have checked all those boxes. What he asks more often than, than not is, why do they want to serve? And that is where we tell your story. So for this governor, that is what, that is what he wants to hear. And those are the discussions we have. And it is why um, when I came on the interview process and the discussions that we have um, really became a lot more critical. We prepare, prepare candidate summaries and it is all about the person in their life. It is the one chance that this governor gets to know his appointee. Um, and so that's really what the discussion usually uh, centers around. So once he does make that uh, decision, um, then we notify the appointees, we notify the people who haven't been chosen. Um, we begin to work on bios, which um, if you've ever seen the press releases, um, they go out, we put, we go, they go out probably multiple times a week because we have so many people going out. Um, and then that's really when the work starts. So as a board member, and again, um, every board is a little bit different. The vast majority, uh, I would want to say over 90% of our boards are non-paid volunteer um, positions. We have a very small number of full-time and part-time boards that are paid, um, like the one that I served, the LRB that I served on for 15 years. Um, so the vast majority are non-paid. Um, we do pay per diem, and that varies depending on the workload. Uh, sometimes it's $50, like $100, it could go up to $400, depending on how much work that board um, entails. And then if we do get to the point where people are meeting in person and traveling, um, we also reimburse for, for those costs. Um, also, each of these boards have staff attached to them. So we don't simply sort of appoint you press release and send you on your way. We make sure there is usually an executive director um, and they really do help with all of the onboarding um, and um, usually the appointee takes the oath at their first meeting, um, which then comes back to us. Once that happens, um, we transmit that to the Senate. The Senate is responsible for um, what we call the Senate confirmation process, um, where they, and, and again, it sounds scarier than it is, um, where they have a Senate rules committee. And at that point, they will start to ask for information about the appointee. We have staff on my staff that walk you through every uh, point of that process. They talk to you about what your what your answers will be. They help with answering any questions the Senate might have. They will be there, uh, you know, to support you during the hearing. But really, the senators are just um, really trying to get to know the individual um, and make sure that they are also a, a good fit. And we have we work very closely with them. So. Um, you will often see that either on the application or on the boards and commissions um, if it is Senate confirmable and the vast, vast majority um, are Senate confirmable, but um, I just don't want that to scare anybody, anybody off. Um, and then terms as far as how long um, can run um, anywhere from two years uh, to as many, uh, I, my board was five years. Um, I would say most of them probably are around in the three to four year range, but again, those are um, answers that we can give you once we have uh, have that discussion and the person serves for that term and normally that you can be appointed again, especially on the licensing boards. Um, and so it really does allow the individual to learn the process because we know people very often are coming on and, um, you know, it's a new experience. And if it's not a new experience, maybe the subject matter might be new. Um, and so it really does give people an opportunity to not only contribute, but to serve in leadership roles, you know, to serve as a vice chair or chair of a board. Um, so, and we are always available um, as are the uh, staff at the agency and department. So with that, I think I will um, close. I look forward to um, answering questions that um, individuals might have and um, hopefully you'll consider putting your hat in the ring. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very informative remarks, Secretary. We look forward to uh, uh, seeing you again later on when we're doing Q&A, and that's a good opportunity for me to remind people that you can submit questions 
through Zoom's Q&A feature. And when we get to Q&A, we'll um, uh, begin uh, uh, pulling those out of the Q&A and uh, uh, asking them, if you're viewing this event that's being live streamed on Facebook live, we are monitoring the chat section on Facebook. So if you have questions, feel free to post them and staff will try to get those questions to me as well. Um, I neglected to uh, thank Sean Landris, uh, my good friend in Santa Monica for his role in forming uh, Sivruta a number of years ago. Um, and that provides me with a good opportunity to uh, tell you that Sean um, is the chair of the city of Santa Monica's planning commission. Um, don't forget about your local government opportunities. Uh, I know Sean would want me to uh, tell you that. I know that many of you are aware of those, but those can be rewarding appointments as well. It's now my great privilege to introduce Juan Torres, who serves as Deputy Chief of Staff to Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon, and uh, among his many responsibilities with the Speaker's office, he is the Speaker's top appointments advisor. I see him twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays when we have floor sessions because he also monitors and sort of runs the floor um, uh, for the speaker. We just heard the process for getting an appointment from the governor and Mr. Torres is now going to tell us about the process to get appointed by the assembly speaker. Juan, welcome and thank you for being here. The Zoom is now yours. Thank you, Senator Member Bloom. I, I want to first thank you and the Jewish Federation. Uh, you are all lucky to have a great champion in Mr. Bloom up here in Sacramento. Uh, we do see each other every uh, two, two days a week, usually sometimes even more when we have to have important conversations. But uh, I, I will say that our uh, major difference between us and the governor's office and kudos to the great work that Secretary Rivera Hernandez has done in her tenure there uh, is just volume. The, the, the governor's office, to their credit, just has a lot more uh, boards and commissions to appoint to. Uh, in our office, the speaker has uh, 220 public appointments uh, that we uh, vet uh, and have uh, make recommendations to speaker for appointments. Uh, so I'm just going to very generally go through and give you some uh, themes uh, to consider as you consider applying uh, for board or commission. Uh, and then I'm going to try to uh, Summarize quickly so we can get to, to the important questions you all have. Uh, first and foremost, please be patient. Uh, and I will say, be a little bit more patient with the governor's office as well. The, the, again, the volume is, is so tremendous there. Be patient. It, it seems like it's a process where we will contact you and then we kind of uh, pause and then we contact you again in, in a month. That, that's actually normal. Um, it's normal for, for you to send us an application. It'll take us a while to get to it. And, and contact you after that. Uh, be honest, uh, share your experience. Uh, a good story I like to give is we were talking to someone uh, about a uh, appointment to the Board of Registered Nursing. Uh, and when we got to a conversation about uh, their schedule uh, and their ability to attend the meetings, um, she responded by saying, what really depends on uh, what day of the week it is, because I meet every week with my uh, child's teacher uh, because he's a special education um, student. And, and when they revealed that, we, we talk, talked to them about the fact that we had a position available for a parent on the special ed commission. Uh, and so having those conversations helps us find the right board or commission for you. Uh, so, so be honest, uh, you know, things happen. Catherine referenced this. Uh, we have all had uh, challenges in our lives and uh, the more honest you are, uh, the better. Uh, we will find out when we do background checks about some of those challenges. And so if you, from the beginning, let us know, we make sure that we find the, the right board or commission for you. Uh, also, be open to other boards or commissions. Oftentimes, I will talk to someone about, uh, you know, the Arts Council is a very popular uh, board or, uh, that the state has, and m many people will apply to that. And obviously, for the speaker, he has only one appointment. And so people feel discouraged because they didn't get that appointment. In fact, there's only one slot. Uh, so be open to other boards and commissions. There might be another board that just tackles that important issue just as much as the board you're uh, initially interested in. Um, also be honest about your schedule. Uh, some boards meet monthly, 
that can translate into two or three days a month. Uh, many of them have different subcommittees that could also translate to another day in a month. Uh, other boards meet quarterly, some meet twice a year. So being uh, honest about your ability to uh, dedicate the time and, and, and um, commitment to that board of commission is very important to know from the beginning. Um, so let me talk very briefly about the process. So there's an application online. Uh, the speakers, uh, Brendan has put the application on his website. Uh, we also disclose the, the boards and commissions that he has appointments to. Uh, we review those applications. You can list up to three boards or commissions that you're interested in. You can leave it blank and say, look, I, I'm willing to have a conversation. Uh, and I don't know what board or commission uh, I'm interested in, uh, but you can put up to three. Then we have uh, an initial introductory meeting where I or, or someone on our team will call you and, and I'll just get to know you a little bit. Why are you interested in serving? Uh, what are the unique characteristics of your experience? And that helps me and, and our team kind of find the right board or commission to talk to you about. Um, once we do that, we usually apply uh, that knowledge and, and identify two, possibly three boards for you to review. Uh, we hand you a, re a registry page that kind of gives the information about what's the purpose behind that board, uh, how often they meet, um, and then we wait for your response. And this is another opportunity to be honest. Uh, tell us like, that's not exciting. I, I'm not interested in that board or tell me more about that board. And once we narrow it down to, to one board, we have a uh, secondary interview where we uh, talk to you more deeply about those issues confronting that board. Uh, I bring on our policy staffer that staffs that board for, for the speaker. And we dig a little deeper, uh, ask you about your perspectives on those issues and um, you know, interview. And that's when we start interviewing you know, three to five candidates for slot. Uh, once those interviews are done, uh, I then brief the speaker. I, I do that uh, ideally every two, sometimes three weeks. And for every position that he has available, my goal is always to provide two strong candidates. Uh, the speaker then provides us with an answer. Uh, once the speaker has decided on who to appoint, we uh, simply write a letter to the board or in commission and one to the chief clerk's office and that person uh, is appointed to that board. Um, so it can be rather efficient once we have an answer from the speaker. Um, and, and then the next thing is, you know, who do we look for? Uh, is, a, is a common question I get. Uh, and I will say we look for people who reflect the, uh, the diversity of the, of the state. Uh, one of the first things that uh, uh, the speaker uh, tasked me to do is to look at the demographics of the makeup of the appointees that the speaker had at the time uh, when he became speaker in 2016. Um, and we looked at everything. We looked at gender, geography, ethnicity, and, and to give an example of kind of the work that we uh, focused on, uh, when he became speaker, uh, unfortunately, only 36% of the speaker's appointees at that time were women. Uh, and so we worked really hard to, to increase that. And I'm really proud that as of now, 52% of the speaker's appointments are women. So we are working really aggressively to make sure that his appointments do reflect the state. We also look for uh, consumer advocates. We look for people who are going to be advocating for the general public uh, he has some appointments to various uh, consumer affairs uh, boards, you know, the popular ones being the medical board, the board of pharmacy versus nursing. Uh, we're looking for people who are going to say, what is these, what, what do these actions, what do these regulations mean to the average Californian? Uh, and that's kind of the vision that we, we always try to work through. Uh, here's, who, here's who we do not appoint. The speaker uh, has determined he will not appoint any uh, registered lobbyists that have um, do business here in Sacramento. So as a general rule, he, he does not uh, appoint them. Uh, and he also, uh, to, to uh, my detriment, he doesn't appoint uh, legislative staff either. He feels like there's different roles for, for the public and uh, we have the ability to, to advocate within the Capitol. So those are the two folks that he does not appoint to. Uh, you know, I, I, I will end it by, by saying that the most effective thing you can do is fill out an application. The best way to do it is to apply, apply, apply. Let's have that initial conversation. Let's find out what um, you uh, can bring to the table, what board is the best suited for you and what we can do to work together. But um, So again, I wanna thank Jason member for, for his advocacy up here in Sacramento. 
and look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. That was great. Uh, it's time for questions and answers. Uh, we had a few questions that were submitted in advance um, and a number that have come in this evening. Um, I'm going to start with one that's a little bit self-serving. And the question is, are commissions and boards preset or can new ones be created? Uh, while it's uh, not common, we do have the ability to create new boards and commissions. And in fact, this is the self-serving part, um, I have a bill uh, that is moving its way through the legislature that would uh, create a new state commission on the state of hate. Um, uh, this is obviously a response to the dramatic increase in hate conduct and crime that we've seen in our local communities in the state and really around the world. Um, and uh, uh, so I certainly don't know whether that uh, uh, bill is going to survive the legislative process. Oh, I'm sure it will. Um, and then we'll make its way to the governor's desk where I'm sure it will be signed. But once it's signed, it will become effective and then there will be an application process, presumably, um, to fill slots on that commission. So it is something that we can do and we occasionally do. And uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully there'll be at least one uh, additional uh, state commission in the months to come. Uh, the next question is uh, um, about the Senate. And the question is, does the leader of the Senate get to make appointments to boards and commissions like the speaker does? And how does that process work? We don't have a Senate representative here, but I'll bet that uh, one or both of our speakers know a little bit about that process. I will say yes, and then I'll let Juan, since it's probably more similar to their process, uh, maybe talk about what, since we've done these together with the Senate before, <laughs> go ahead, Juan. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, in full disclosure, I, I actually worked for Senate Rules Committee uh, for a while doing appointments. So I, I, I do know that they do also have appointments. It's slightly different. Uh, in the speaker's case, he uh, is the appointing authority. And in the Senate, the appointing authority is actually the Senate Committee on Rules. Uh, the pro tem obviously has a big role in that. So she makes those recommendations to the committee. And uh, I wanna say 99% of the time, the committee does take her recommendations. Uh, but the Senate's unique power of uh, confirmation is this, the biggest difference between the speaker and the Senate. Um, I too did some confirmation hearings under uh, the former governor. Uh, so it is a, a unique process. It is a process that, you know, Catherine has mentioned uh, that the governor's office would walk people through, uh, but the primary difference is the, uh, the confirmation authority. Uh, Mr. Bloom, on your initial question about like how these boards get created, some are created by the constitution, the Coastal Commission probably being one of the most known and uh, familiar. Uh, some are created uh, by initiative. And in fact, in the last election, uh, Catherine and I just worked recently on uh, making uh, recommendations to our bosses to appoint people to the privacy board that was right. created by the recent, uh, by, by the voters. And then of course, uh, by legislation. And so perhaps we'll see a commission on hate crimes uh, that we'll appoint to uh, next year. So those are the three primary uh, ways these boards and commissions are created. Great. Um, we do have a request um, uh, uh, to uh, repeat the governor's appointments unit website information. Sure. Um, so the uh, website that is posted is correct. You have to scroll down and it'll say online application and you click on that and then you scroll down and it'll say begin application and then you can actually begin filling it out online. When uh, seeking an appointment to a board or commission, is it better to research their current objectives uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and to propose how one would get involved? Or is it better to have uh, your own ideas and objectives that you feel need attention, that I feel need attention, the speaker asks, or the questioner asks, and uh, would help make things better for constituents? So what, what is it that you're looking for in terms of, uh, feedback from uh, uh, applicants? I think probably a little bit of both. I, we would want to know what you think about what the certain entity is, is doing now. And we will often ask in the interview um, if you were rec making recommendations for uh, changes or other um, areas of policy um, attention, you know, what would those be? So, um, I mean, I think definitely both are, are helpful. 
Is yeah, there... I, I, oh, sorry. sorry, I was going to say, nope. I, I, I agree with Catherine. There might be particular issues that the Speaker's Office is paying attention to. Uh, for example, uh, the Coastal Commission is definitely uh, a commission that the Speaker tracks, and so he interviews candidates for that. And so we might be asking you specific questions about how do you feel about development along the coast? Uh, how do you feel about public access to the coast? Um, and so we're going to definitely want to have uh, people who have a clear objective uh, for that commission. Other times it's, you know, just the experience of advocating for, for the public. And so it really depends uh, on the board that we have an appointment to. Can government employees serve on boards and commissions? The answer is for us is yes. Um, it's not that common um, and definitely not if there's, let's say some sort of conflict in regards to what the yeah. person does in their pay job um, and what they would be doing on the board. All right. Um, is there a comprehensive list uh, along with descriptions of boards and commissions that can be found somewhere. Juan, um, do you want to answer and then I can answer? Well, I, I, I'll answer. We, we, do, we do have a list on our website. Uh, it just lists the boards and commissions. We don't have uh, additional information. We provide that to the candidates once they have applied. I, I, will, I will know, and Catherine will probably uh, say this as well, the governor's website is actually a fantastic resource and uh, oftentimes the uh, boards are the same. So if you if you go to the governor's website, they, they usually provide a little bit more information about the purpose uh, of these boards. So, uh, but as C Catherine mentioned, um, if you take time to, to research the boards and commissions that you're interested in, look at their agendas, uh, that will give you a much better indication of the work before it uh, versus a, a, you know, a piece of paper on, online. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So uh, a question here asks that to please describe the time duration of the process volunteers have to undergo in order to be successful, uh, as well as the respective terms of each. I think the terms vary depending on the order uh, commission, but uh, generally what uh, time frame do they fall within? Um, so I will say and kind of reiterate what, what Juan has said before about the patience factor on this. Um, I came to this position in, in a very unique um, way because I've been on the other side. I have been appointed, um, you know, four times. So I had to go through this process. And what I will say is there was nothing similar. Um, they all varied in different ways because I think what happens, um, and I did try to take the best of those processes, um, in my experience, and try to bring those, but there's so much you can't account for. Um, and so um, the short answer is there is no standard um, for how long an appointment might take. And there are several reasons for that. Um, one is at any given point, a deputy is working on um, anywhere from 50 to 75 different positions um, that might be in different stages. And what often will happen um, is it's kind of a hurry up and wait uh, kind of process where we're looking for someone, we're looking for someone, you'll have a ton of communication from us. And then you, it will be maybe a month or two before we get back to you. And that is because once we kind of identify a certain group, then we have to schedule uh, the interviews. And, and during that time, something else might come up where we're a quorum problem, I don't, some sort of urgency, a policy problem. The governor decides that he wants to prioritize something. And there's only one for a certain portfolio. So they jump around and it's like putting out fires. Um, so it is not a linear process at all. It, it just, it goes all, any given day, you're working on any number of, of appointments. Um, what I will say, the reason why I told the deputies um, that we would be putting up their information and that once they do talk to somebody, you know, to make sure the person can contact them is for that reason. Um, I said, you know, the one thing I always wanted to know was just what is the status and why it might be that way. So people, you know, don't know if 
are they not interested in me anymore? Am I not a candidate anymore? When more often it is simply, we have to put that on hold because I have to go work on this. It's very likely I will be back around to you in a month or next week, or you know, it might be two months. Um, and so, and a lot of that depends on the urgency of the vacancy. So um, although it's not always satisfactory, I, we just try to make sure that people at least know where they stand, even if it's not great news or they have to wait longer. Um, because there really is, it, it's, it's, it's a little hectic in our office. I tell people it is not a well-oiled machine. I mean, it is any given time. It is, is very hectic on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, government is a scary place in general. Um, <laughs> what, uh, uh, what conflicts of interest do you look at when determining commission appointments? Uh, so, sometimes the conflicts are listed in the statute. Uh, the medical board, for example, lists very clear conflicts. Uh, so we, of course, will follow that direction. Uh, we also, I mean, the, the primary ones we look for is financial uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, you know, oftentimes if you are married to a pharmacist, you can't serve uh, on the board of pharmacy. If, you, if your children are pharmacists, if, if you have any business that has income from a pharmacist, those are the things that kind of stand out. But there's other conflicts too. Uh, for example, if you happen to be a city council member, uh, you're oftentimes in a dual office holder position. And so you cannot serve on some of these boards unless it's explicitly allowed in statute. So those are the conflicts that uh, we as staff have to monitor. And once we get closer to finding a right board or commission within an individual, we'll go through those conflicts. But the big conflicts are, are those. I, I will also say there are um, some political uh, perspectives or perception uh, conflicts that we also talk to candidates about. There are times that we do ask candidates to provide us a, a letter about making sure that if there is any issues that come up, that they would be happy to recuse themselves from that action. So oftentimes, you know, we, we do that uh, to protect the public. But those are the conflicts that usually arise out of the board's commissions. One tip. Exactly oh, please oh. go ahead. I was just saying it is exactly very similar in the, the governor's office as well. Um, and we do have lawyers that if we um, need you know, to ask them questions, we work through that. Um, what I will say is I'm going to make a quick pitch for, um, and you can see these on our website, the public slots. So as one was saying, you know, there are on these boards and commissions, very often it will say you have to be a licensee. So that's, for example, we have to put a pharmacist or a doctor in a slot, um, or it might be, you know, some other um, sort of designated slot, but pretty much all of them have public slots and you'll see that. And what that means is you can't have any interest. So you're not, you don't have a vested interest. And that is the really the accountability slot, um, you know, for the state is somebody watching over the board. They also tend to be the person that we probably work very closely with, um, you know, as well. And as you can imagine, sometimes it could be very hard. Let's say, for example, to get a public member to sit on the podiatry board or the osteopathic board. But what I try to tell people is it's a great spot to get a start in how to serve on a board. It's also great for younger uh, people that are starting out in their careers um, that want to see what it's like to serve on a board. So um, I think those, as you'll go through, if you look at our list, you kind of can gloss over and be like, well, that's not, I'm not interested in any of these things. But if you think about it, as far as what the purpose of those public slots are, I hope you might um, consider um, because they tend to be very tough for us to fill. Um, and they, so that for that reason, they tend to be less um, competitive as, as well. I wanted to uh, 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 give you all a tip that uh, might prove helpful. If you're able to make contact with somebody who is already on a board or commission, um, you can talk to them about what it's like and what the workload is like, what the travel uh, 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 requirements might be. Uh, when I was appointed to the California Coastal Commission, I was very naive and I thought that I would easily be able to integrate serving on the, uh, on the commission with all of the other things I did, which at that time was serving on the Santa Monica City Council and uh, uh, being a full-time attorney. Um, what I soon found out, in fact, on the first meeting after I was appointed, um, I sat down at my desk and there was a stack of paper, literally, that I could not see over. That was the first meeting's agenda. 
Um, meetings uh, uh, of the Coastal Commission last from one to three days. Um, they're very intensive. They involve travel, which is wonderful to um, coastal areas um, all up and down the state, but the time commitment is considerable. Um, fortunately, I was able to uh, integrate things into my life and, and it all worked out. And it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. But uh, had I had the opportunity to talk uh, in more detail to a sitting commissioner or two, I would have had a, a more clear expectation of what the uh, responsibilities were gonna be like. Um, uh, there is a, a question here that has already been answered, which is uh, do state boards or commissions pay a salary or honorarium? And that differs with the commission. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, it's not really an honorarium in most cases, it's a per diem. Um, you will not survive on the per diem. Um, uh, and it doesn't increase very often. Uh, can you tell us what it is now? And is it the same for all boards and commissions? They, they do, they vary. Um, it's supposed to be commensurate with kind of work. Um, but as you said, it's, it's more of a really appreciate you taking this time day off. Um, here's, you know, a hundred bucks. Um, as opposed to really compensating people, let's say for, you know, a day of, of work. Um, but it, yeah, it usually, it, it varies. On the Coastal Commission at the time that I served, it was, if I recall correctly, $200 per day um, uh, of, of meeting. And so if a meeting lasted three days, um, it would be the uh, a sum of $600. Um, uh, you also were paid uh, uh, per diem for preparation time, if I remember correctly. And uh, so that was a little bit helpful, but um, uh, those commission meetings took roughly a week um, out of every month uh, uh, for me to uh, prepare and then attend meetings. So it was very intensive. Um, next question. If we just want to support the administration using our abilities and know we would be value adds in a multitude of appointments, is a general application the best way to get recognized or would sending multiple applications for individual roles give us a better chance of an appointment? So you only need to fill out one application and then on there um, we list every available uh, appointment. Um, and as if there is a, say a new board or commission that is added, we immediately add that as well to um, the listing. And so, you know, you can pick, you don't have to choose one. Um, you can pick multiple um, areas. We know people are interested in, you know, you could be interested in labor and be interested in housing and also have a legal background and want to serve maybe on a judicial commission or performance. So, um, you know, we have no problem with, you know, people sort of expressing kind of the variations of their, you know, of their, of their interest. I think if it gets to the point where we can't tell what the interests are anymore, um, it just becomes less, less valuable. Um, but as I said, very often we are pulling people out based just upon, um, you know, who they are a lot of the times, uh, and, and we'll also reach out in that way. Our application allows uh, applicants to list three board or commissions, but there's also a uh, area where you can list general issue areas, education, healthcare, environment, uh, financial uh, affairs that help guide us a little bit more about what board or commissions may be good for you. So the next question uh, uh, is, are there appointment seasons? Meaning are there better or worse times to apply and does this vary according to the board? Oh, I wish, because then I could take a vacation <laughs> when they had an off season. <laughs> um, people are terming out every month. So there, are, it is a constant rotation that is happening. And as I mentioned, because we have close to you know 4,000, um, there are people constantly terming out. Um, and so there is no season. Um, but you can also, again, if you're something specific, you're interested, you can get an idea of when the next people sort of might be up or when there might be um, the next opportunity. And if you see something on the website and it's not listed as currently vacant, it will be at some point. So if there is something you're interested in, and even though it doesn't say it's vacant now, I would still reach out um, and express your interest in that. 
because as I said, we are always in process of then the next um, person. So um, I would definitely not limit yourself in that way um, either. I think that's a great question. And, and I, I will honestly say that um, getting the speaker's attention on boards of commission is probably very, very challenging uh, in June when we're uh, negotiating the budget and at the end of session, which is you know late August, early September. It also happens uh, that as Mr. Bloom referenced earlier, I'm also in charge of the floor session stuff. So it also distracts me. So those are the probably the two key moments that um, we have less ability to focus on appointments. But uh, as Catherine said, it's ongoing all year long. So the uh, next question has to do with uh, uh, gubernatorial transitions. Um, so for example, when Governor Brown um, finished his second term and Governor Newsom uh, took office, uh, uh, well, does, does he as a successor appoint all new replacements? How does this all work? Um, there are a few variations. One is if you are a member, let's say of the administration where you've been appointed to an actual job, um, you are always at pleasure um, and uh, can be removed by the current governor or any governor that comes um, in after. Um, for those that are in terms and once they have been um, confirmed by the Senate, they stay in those terms for the duration. So if you're confirmed by Newsom for two years and there was another governor that came in, um, you would stay in that term for the amount of time that, um, that the length is. Are there any age requirements to apply for uh, any of the appointments? Well, no, on our, I will say for the governor's office, there are, there are not any age requirements. We have um, appointed people um, as young as, I mean, we tend to not get people um, that are um, really young, but you know, we late twenties, early thirties um, are, you know, it's not unusual to have people um, in that, in that category. Yeah, we, we don't have age requirements either, but I, I, I agree with Catherine. Uh, the experiences are, are difficult to, to have someone too young to, to be appointed, but it's not impossible. Thank you. Uh, an attendee asks, if I'm an advocate for individuals with developmental disabilities, as well as being the parent of a young adult, would that mean that I would have a conflict of interest if I applied for the current opening on that board? No, is the answer to that. Um, in fact, um, if you look at um, many of those boards, we actually have slots for people who are either advocates or parents. Um, and so they're likely, um, we're actually looking for people who um, are in both of those categories in order to serve. Yeah, the speaker appointed a, a, a business owner who has a disability in his district to the Disability Access Council. Uh, so that uh, uh, you know, those kind of councils, we do want to make sure that we bring on folks that can speak to that community and uh, you know can bring their own experiences to those to those uh, important conversations. The next question is: Is it possible to serve while I'm in college? I certainly hope so. Um, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, we do have, um, it's just, for example, on some of our education boards, there's actual slots for students um, to serve in that capacity and, and they have a process for that. Um, and um, I, I always hesitate to limit anybody. Um, again, I mean, if somebody is interested in serving, I would like, you know, and they know what they're interested in, they should talk to a deputy um, about those opportunities. So I would encourage anybody who's interested to reach out. Um, one person would like to know if there's an opening on the transportation board. Um, I don't believe we currently have an opening on the transportation um, commission because we just made a couple of appointments. Um, so as far as I know, we just, yeah, we just made two. So as far as I know at this point, um, and I don't know when the next ones come up, but I don't believe we have any any openings on that. And then a, a similar question about vacancies regarding schools, teachers, public education. Um, uh, the uh, 
uh, individual says uh, uh, he doesn't notice any vacancies and, and would like to know if that's because there's no board roles in that area or are they filled? Um, if it's anything in the education realm, I would be surprised if we didn't have vacancies because there are several. I will say, Film Commission, Regents, CSU, Community College, those are all highly competitive um, boards. So it would be odd to have um, sort of uh, a vacancy there because we always work to, um, to fill those. Um, it, like usually six months ahead of time, we're starting that, that search. Um, but we have other boards. We have the Teacher Credentialing Board, uh, Student Aid Commission. Um, so there are other ones, Board of Education. There are others where um, I either, if it doesn't show vacancies now, they are likely coming up. But also I know we are, we are losing people um, every, <laughs> every week. So <laughs> for various reasons. Um, so, you know, if there's a specific area, um, I would uh, recommend you reach out to my deputy, Jay Jefferson, who does all um, education. And we may have uh, uh, answered this earlier, but is there a minimum age for any appointments? A minimum? No. No. Can you serve on a local board uh, or commission and a state board or commission at the same time? I, I would say as long as you have the capacity to demonstrate that you can do both effectively, uh, we don't have an objection to that. Uh, uh, you know, but, but telling us early on that that's something you're doing helps us uh, you know, find the right board commission for you. We may not put you on one of our busier boards or commissions, uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's very possible to be able to do both. Uh, we don't typically appoint one individual to two uh, boards or commissions that the speaker has an appointment to. Uh, that doesn't mean that that individual can have a gubernatorial appointment and a speaker appointment, uh, but typically the speaker does not give one person two speaker appointments. Yeah, we also appoint people who are um, serving in elected office. In fact, there are boards where we actually have to appoint elected officials to those uh, those positions. Um, but in addition to that, we have people that are serving, um, at, you know, city council um, as well as sitting maybe on a water board or, or something similar to that. Um, but also similar to what Juan said, um, this governor does not usually, um, I don't wanna say at all, cause I have, we have too many, I have no idea if there are any that are serving on two, but it is our, it has been our practice that we also um, do not put people on more than one border commission. Thank you. One uh, uh, individual asks, uh, um, how, to, how to know if the um, commission on the state of hate uh, actually does become a, a, a commission. Um, that is uh, Assembly Bill 1126. You can track that by Googling the bill number. Um, you're also more than welcome to uh, uh, contact my district office or my Sacramento office. We'll be happy to provide you with uh, the status of, of the bill. So uh, um, this individual says, I'm very interested in working towards creating a new board in the state. What is the best way to achieve this goal? And I, I think we've answered this question in other contexts, but you could seek a constitutional amendment, uh, which is uh, um, quite a chore. Um, uh, you could ask your legislator to run legislation, um, uh, creating a new board or commission. And uh, what am I forgetting? Actually, you know, I didn't reference this before, but the, the other way um, uh, is a task force created by, by the governor. Uh, oh, you did, yes. That, that's uh, another way a border commission can, can get created. Uh, and so that's the that's option too, not to put pressure, pressure on Catherine there. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. Um, <laughs> spe speaking of whom, uh, this one would be um, uh, for uh, 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 the governor's staff. Does the first partner 
oversee any boards. I'm interested in uh, uh, gender equity initiatives. She, we actually work very closely um, with the first partner's office, um, especially on the Commission on Women and Girls um, is probably what the one that she is most um, involved with. She's also an uh, honorary chair, I believe is her title, of the Cal California Volunteers. Um, but as many people know, she is also a, a, a very busy businesswoman as well as a mother of four. So, um, you know, normally we just might inquire with her on, on areas that she has expressed interest, but um, not where she is, you know, where she is directly overseeing a board or permission. Where do boards with no stated location for uh, 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 meet? Um, well, right now everybody's meeting on Zoom. Right. Uh, most boards have um, an office, a, a physical, even now, still have a physical presence and, um, and place. And then also, if you look at past agendas, it will tell you some boards um, meet in the exact same place every time. This is again, this would be pre-COVID and maybe post-COVID. Um, the exact same place every time that that they meet. Um, that was how my board was, um, except with some few exceptions. Um, some boards move around the state and may meet in different cities um, throughout the state throughout the year. So it really does vary on the um, the board. But each of the agendas will show you the. Um, the actual address of where that meeting was held so you can get a good idea of um, where they're meeting. If you have an interest in something but no direct experience, say wildlife preservation, is that enough to fill out an application or does one need at least some direct experience with the area of interest? I would say that if it's an area like that, um, and, and again, if you, we would look at the makeup of the board, most people would have that varied, but experience um, on that topic, unless it's a board that has a public slot. And then again, we have people who have zero experience in that area serving in um, public slots. So we're looking more for you know, the judgment um, and the interest um, and um, in, very often it's maybe consumer protection or um, the veterinary board. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you like pets. Uh, so um, it just sort of it just sort of varies um, depending on the board. Yeah, the qualifications can be sometimes uh, pretty broad. So uh, in that example, uh, we may be limited to appoint someone who has his uh, experience in wildlife preservation, and also could say or as a member of an or, uh, environmental organization, which can be pretty broad. And so there's other ways we can meet the criteria, uh, but usually the public slot is, is pretty pretty broad. So we work with the individuals to find uh, that, that appropriate experience. Is there a disadvantage or an advantage to having previously served on a state board? I mean, I would say it depends on, on the board. Um, we're not going to put you on probably on a high profile or really complex board um, if you haven't had some um, experience. It doesn't necessarily always have to be board experience, but probably um, some pr greater professional um, experience that would make you, you a good fit. But um, when it comes to the licensing boards, I think those are great opportunities to see how a board operates and what, um, you know, sort of what it takes uh, to serve on a board. We'd have people who have started out on boards that are not as um, time consuming, learn that um, and serve their two terms and, and became incredible board members and we have elevated them to another board. Um, and so that also is common. So. Um, I mean, it just, it kind of depends, but I always try to encourage people if, if you're interested in learning what serve, you know, public service is about on a board, um, we could definitely, we definitely have one for you. <laughs> These are interesting questions because they all obviously come from people who are already involved and want to be more involved. And uh, uh, that's certainly true for this question, uh, which is can unpaid elected officials, for example, people who serve on LA's neighborhood council boards get appointments? Does being civically engaged in this way hurt or harm one's chance of an appointment? 
I, I will say it usually helps. Your community involvement helps a lot. The conflicts really are uh, for elected city council members because the, the, the statute's very uh, strict about dual office holding, but generally community organizations uh, are sitting on different boards. Uh, oftentimes we get uh, folks who are board members of their local hospital or a local nonprofit. Those are always great ways to demonstrate your commitment to an issue. And so we, we I think that only uh, helps uh, an, applicant, an applicant. What Juan said. Um, here's a question about the uh, Arts Council, um, uh, which uh, uh, is, uh, can, can you explain a little bit more about uh, what the Arts Council covers? Uh, for example, what arts are included? I'll let Juan take that since he mentioned it. Yeah, thank, thanks, Catherine. I, I will say this is a good time to say that we're, we're both very, very much generalists. <laughs> We, we don't really dig deep uh, on a lot of these issues, but the Arts Council is, I will say it's one of our more popular board um, that there's a great uh, amount of interest. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, they, they, the board itself and the leadership of, of the Arts Council really sets the priorities for, for the council and works with their staff to, to determine that. I think generally the arts is pretty, pretty inclusive of all types of arts. So, um, but we can try to provide you with more specific answers after that. But uh, the leadership of every board really guides the work of, of the staff, whether that's the Arts Council or- um, One of their uh, other primary functions is um, they distribute grant money uh, to various organizations. And so um, various arts groups and types of arts um, get reflected through the decisions of the, of the council. And, as Juan mentioned, it's probably, again, right under um, Film Commission, Arts and Humanities are both also very, very competitive areas. I, I would, I'll take this opportunity to also reference the, the fact that we do have a cultural and historical endowment uh, board uh, that uh, has historically funded capital outlay projects for arts organizations across the state. Uh, to be fair, it's running out of money, so we need to work to give them a little bit more. Uh, but it's a partner with the Arts Council. Arts Council does a lot of program uh, funding uh, and the endowment hopefully does a lot more capital outlay projects. And can I just add, because somebody pointed this out to me at another Zoom that I, that I did, when I say also that things are really competitive, I don't wanna say that to discourage people because somebody has to serve. And if you're the right fit, you're gonna be the right appointee. Um, I only say that because people often want to know just, you know, are there a hundred people that I'm fine, you know, sort of going to have to buy uh, for a position with, or are there, you know, 10. Um, so I just want to make sure that people don't take that as don't apply. Um, please do consider it. I, I only just want to make that clear. <laughs> like, I just try to let people know up front. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add that sometimes we have very strong candidates. We may have four or five really strong candidates, but there's only one slot. Uh, and so that does not mean we did not like the, the applicant. It's just, we don't have another slot. And in fact, there are times that I've called Catherine and I said, hey, Catherine, I have three really good people. I could only do one, here's, here's the other two. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we do talk. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we're able to, to nudge you uh, over to the governor's office, not because we don't think you're good, we think you're great, it's just, we don't have another slot. Well, I think we have time for one more question and uh, uh, I can help provide some of the answer to this one. And the question is, do you expect boards to continue to meet remotely post pandemic? And I think um, there's probably gonna be a collective shrug of shoulders here. Um, we've certainly learned a lot uh, 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 in the past uh, uh, year plus where We've uh, implemented remote meetings across the board, including here in the Capitol. Uh, uh, and uh, there are pieces of legislation, there are a number of pieces of legislation um, that seek to address what the future should look like. And uh, uh, at this point, I would say it's up in the air um, exactly when that transition will take place, either back to a state of normalcy or a hybrid approach where some meetings are remote and some meetings are uh, 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 in the traditional model. Uh, do either of our speakers have anything uh, uh, additional to add to that? 
No, I think your guess is as is, good is, is my, as mine uh, would be. I know there are some requirements just from my time serving on the board around public access and um, needing to be in the same place and people need to have access. I don't know how much um, if, you know, if that will be addressed. Um, but, uh, and I think depending on the board and commission, as you mentioned, it may, you know, be a hybrid of some sorts, but we definitely don't have any certainty around what the future is going to hold. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Secretary Rivera Hernandez, uh, Mr. Torres. Thank you both for your time and for sharing all of this very valuable information uh, uh, this evening. I want to thank also Camille Sanchez uh, uh, and Kelly Rogers with your offices for working with my staff to get you here and uh, uh, into this event uh, 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 successfully. It seems to have uh, gone very smoothly. Thank you to the Jewish Federation of Greater LA for partnering with us on this event. And thank you to Rabbi Noah Farkas and Cece Filer. I want to thank the staff of JFED to Elisa Finston, Mary Kohav, and Rachel Zayden for working so well with our office and helping to promote this event. Um, I want to thank my staff, particularly Melissa Koffler and Josh Kirpies who are monitoring uh, my every move and hopefully won't have too much criticism after we're done. Uh, most importantly, we all want to thank you, the attendees for taking the time to learn how you can take part in boards and commissions to help shape public policy for our community and the entire state. Thank you for wanting to be involved. It's very much appreciated and needed. Good night, be safe. And thank you very much.